Hi, I'm Lloyd from Bumstead Bicycles, and this newest video is going to be the 12 things to consider when you're buying an e-bike. So first thing is going to be, what are you going to use it for? Um, there's multiple, multiple uses you can use an e-bike for. Is it exercise? Is it just sheer recreation? Is it replacing a car so that you don't have to use a car? Is it your RVing and you want to use it to get around the campground? Are you a mountain biker? Are you a road bike rider that's just looking for, you know, a little extra help to keep up on the ride? So first thing you got to ask yourself is what are you going to do with the bike? What, you know, what are your dreams of this or what are your intended purposes? Then on that, then you can narrow it down because there's so many different e-bikes. Part of why you're probably watching this is you're searching the internet trying to figure out the right bike. So let me see if I can help with that. Recreational riders, most of the time you're gonna look for something with comfort, not maybe the hugest range, not too critical. Uh, could be range, distance, those kind of things. But most of the time I've found for the recreational riders, maybe they haven't ridden a bike in a while, so comfort seems to be the biggest issue. So let me show you a couple different bikes kind of in that comfort aspect would be something like this. You have a nice wide comfortable seat, a step through frame, which makes it very easy to get on and off of the bike. You have a, a swept back handlebar. You notice me sitting on this, bike's a little small, but you sit very upright, um, very comfortable to ride. It's kind of in a relaxed riding position. For a lot of people that are just getting back into cycling, Maybe they're not going to go very far. You, you want it to be a comfortable e-bike. Now, in comparison to that, this model, still comfortable to ride, but a little narrower saddle, a more flattened handlebar, fixed riding position. Um, a lot of people on this one, we would call more of a commuter bike. You're going to be sitting a little more, a little more weight on the handlebars, a um, little more forward riding position. Now, it doesn't mean somebody that likes comfort bikes couldn't change this bar or stem, put a different saddle on, get to this riding position. But from the manufacturer set up more of a commuter type bike. You use this, maybe you're going 10 or 15 miles each way to work, or you're a little more of an avid rider. You've been riding more traditional bikes and you want to go a little further, a little faster. But I've had a lot of my customers that will, they like some of the other features of this bike and we'll, we will put the more comfort things on. You might be riding a lot of dirt trails or where you live, it's dirt roads or, you know, maybe there's snow or things to where the fat tires come into play. You maybe, I, you know, you could go hunting or camping and you need, you know, racks and and things to where you can carry gear. Um, you might, maybe it's just you want to tow it on the back of the RV, put it on the back of the RV and ride around the campground. Bike like this, I, to me, this is almost like a mini bike from back in the 60s with a, with a motor on it. With this style of seat and handlebars, you're probably not gonna pedal it much, but you can buzz around the campground or around your neighborhood and just have some fun on it. Not gonna get much exercise, but it's, it is an e-bike and might be the right thing for someone that, that they're not interested in pedaling a bike, but they want something electric and legal on the streets that doesn't require a driver's license. You can go that route. Um, again, more of a commuter style bike here. So again, different bikes, different aspects, depending on what you're gonna do with it. You narrow it, narrow your choice down based on your usage and then go from there. Number two on the list would be budget. There's a huge range of prices. I see some of the stuff, I mean, you can buy little almost scooter type bikes, three, four, five hundred dollars. There's high performance mountain and road bikes that can be ten thousand dollars. How do you know where to go? Um, Traditionally in bike shops, you're not gonna find anything under a thousand dollars. Most of the stuff that you find below that is gonna be smaller, inexpensive, 
may serve the purpose. I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying they're horrible, I'm just saying you need to understand what you're getting when you buy a three or four hundred dollar electric bike. Some of them are almost more scooter, they don't even have pedals, but I've seen some in that five, six hundred range. And if it's, you're just doing small, minimal riding, might serve the purpose. Um, for most of us, we're maybe wanting a, a little full-size bike, you're wanting not necessarily performance, but better reliability, longevity, um, being able to be serviced. A lot of the bikes below $1,000, not much ways of getting them serviced that, you know, that won't exceed the price of the bike when you take it to a repair shop. So from $1,000 to $2,000, you start getting into that range of Entry level, recreational, maybe haven't you know you haven't been on a bike in years, and at least in that thousand to two thousand range, you're going to get a bike that's going to be a little more reliable, going to be able to be repaired, um, and give you years of years of use versus maybe only a year of use and you have to throw it away or get rid of it. Something that you could keep for multiple years. Usually above two thousand dollars, you start getting in. Maybe you've already had an e-bike. Maybe you're an avid cyclist that you're already riding on your normal bike as a two or three thousand dollar bike, and you're looking for something just that's of that quality or above. That's when you start getting into the the bikes in those price points. So again, depending on where you fall is where your budget can be. You know, so you know at the very entry level, not much you can do for repair might serve the purpose to start. That midpoint at 1,000 to 2,000, 2,500, you're gonna get serviceable bikes, lots of choices, tons of choices. Um, above that, it's because you're already more of an avid cyclist. Maybe you're gonna do true mountain biking and you need full suspension and a lot of other features besides it just being E. Maybe you're a road bike rider looking to just try and keep up on that club ride and you just don't have the fitness level, so you buy that quality of bike with E, and that gets you in that three to six thousand dollar. You know, that's what it's going to cost. Those regular bikes that you on a group ride could be three to five thousand. So that put you've got to understand that budget for the hire. Number three on my list is size. Most manufacturers will put some kind of a fit guide on there. Um, there's some companies that they only have one size bike or maybe they have a step through and a standard frame. Um, if you have the ability to go into a shop and get size, that really helps. The most important thing is inseam. Um, you can have someone that's six feet tall and five foot eight and their inseam can be the same. So the standover requirements of a, of a bike you know, how high is it right here when you stand over this bike is critical. Step throughs, we can go into some other aspects of the sizing, but on a standard frame bike, you need to be able to stand over this top tube and not be right over. Now, the other aspect is if you stand over this top tube and you're six foot four, and you know, you've got five or six inches clearance, when you go to adjust your seat, the seat's gonna be too high out of the frame. Now your seat's here and your handlebars are here. So most critical thing first is inseam, second then is your torso, then your overall height. So where that can come into play also is maybe you're close on sizing. Maybe you could ride a medium and a large. Then it's a matter for your torso, how, because as the frame gets bigger this way, it also gets longer this way. So again, in step, to, so you want to balance that out. So just like in anything, sizing in your shoes, sizing in your clothing, it's important. The bike, if it's too big or too small, could either be dangerous or very uncomfortable. So in either instance, sizing, you know, you want to know your standover height, inseam. You, maybe then, you know, you might know this on your own. You have longer arms, a short torso, long legs, whatever those features are, take that into consideration. 
So even on a step-through bike where standover is not critical, the frame is smaller. Like this is a small, they also do it in a medium. So the problem, let's say with me on a small is now, not only will this seat be way too low, but it's really close here. So this bike, as you can see probably in the picture, it looks small to me. And even if I raise this seat up to where I need it to be, it's still going to be small here. And now suddenly my handlebars are considerably lower than they would be on the, the right size bike where things are proportioned properly. So definitely do your homework on sizing. You know, know your inseam, know your overall height and compare not only height this way, but top but length this way in considering size. Next on the list, uh, I say standard versus step through frame and pros and cons to each. Um, we're all familiar with a standard frame bike. Some people over the years would call it a men's or boys bike versus the step through frame, which again, used to be, oh, well that's a girl's bike. So what we found over the years is that, let's throw all that out the window. It can be either or, they're generic guys or girls, doesn't matter. Um, pros to a standard frame, just in bikes in general, traditional frames in non-e-bikes, you had a stronger, lighter frame if you went to a traditional. So high performance bikes would always be that triangle style frame. In e-bikes, the frames are considerably strong enough that even in a, a step through, especially for recreational riding, still plenty strong enough for, again, recreational riding. Now, if you're doing, doing the more high performance road or mountain, you're gonna have more of a standard frame. So pros and cons, standard frame, you've gotta swing a leg over, you've gotta work, and then you've gotta worry about standover height as we talked about in size. So, advantage of a step through frame is that you don't have to swing a leg over. You can step through, you don't have to worry about when you're getting mounting or dismounting the bike, landing on that bar. Um, if you've added a luggage rack and maybe a basket or a bag, swinging a leg over gets even harder. So, basic advantage to the step through is just ease of mounting and dismounting the bike. Huge advantage for a lot of us, especially as we get older, but just in general terms, it's just easier to get on and off the bike. And, or, you know, maybe you're commuting and you're in street clothes and, you know, swing it with pants or a skirt for women. This is much easier to get on and off of. So standard versus step through. Pros and cons to each, again, depending on your use of the bike, that hopefully will help you decide. Next on the list is hub drive versus mid-drive motors. Um, what you're gonna, I'll show you both, but what you're gonna find, at least that I have, is the more recreational riders are gonna use a hub drive, the more performance, again, kind of at that higher end on the budget, are gonna use the mid-drive. So a hub drive motor, as it in the wording, the motor is built into the rear hub of the bike. I've seen some bikes with a front hub, but in general, you're gonna see it at the hub. Right here in the rear of the bike, on a mid-drive over here. The motor is built in at the crank assembly. So when you pedal the bike, drives the back wheel. Also the motor drives it. You can't see it in here, but there's a sprocket in here. So the motor then drives the back wheel. In this instance, you have a traditional wheel in the rear versus an electric motor wheel. Um, a lot of shops like that because ease of changing flats. Um, the more performance riders like it because it has a much more natural feel to in coinciding with how your norm, your regular bike rides um, is considerably more expensive than the hub drive systems. But again, more performance riders, <clears throat> you're wanting to keep up with a group of riders that are on traditional bikes, this will fit in better with that. 
Um, doesn't have the brute acceleration of a hub drive motor. There's pros and cons to that. But overall, then one of the things you have to watch if you go to mid-drive too is that you're gonna wear out chain drivetrain components faster because now you have a motor putting stress on the cassette, freewheel, chain, all of your drivetrain parts. It's just a maintenance thing. You gotta make sure you have that checked and maintained a little more because they will wear out faster than they will on a traditional bike. So advantage of mid-drive would be the more high performance riders, the people with the over $2,000 budget, they want, they're already riding regular bikes and they want it to feel like a regular bike and just have a little bit of assist. A lot of the mid-drive motors too don't have any sort of throttle or any way to get you back home if you don't want to pedal. Um, you have to pedal the whole time where a lot of the recreational hub drive motors, you do have a throttle so you have the option of not pedaling. So definitely something to consider there. So again, hub drive versus mid depends on again back to use. What are you trying to do with it? How do you want the bike to feel? Um, for a lot of customers, I'd suggest test riding both. That, that'll answer a lot of whether you like or dislike a particular stuff. Another thing to consider on, on buying an e-bike is the, the power of the motor. Um, you'll see bikes with 250 watt, 350 watt, 500 watt, and 750 watt. Thing to consider there is the terrain you're riding on and the weight of the rider and maybe the things he's attaching to the bike a kid's trailer you know towing extra weight so i mean it's just like power in your car or truck you know you need more power because you live in the mountains or you're trying to go faster um, most uh, from what i've seen the the 250 watt usually is on the more economy stuff or somewhere where very flat, you're just looking for a little assist. Um, 350 seems to be pretty good. Again, it stays more towards on the budget end of it. Um, if, you're ride, if you're a fairly lightweight rider, if you're um, not real hilly terrain, and you're not worried about going above 20 miles an hour, 350 is probably plenty of power for you. 500 seems to be the most popular. The advantage to 500 is even if you're a lighter weight rider, you can easily go 20 miles an hour. If there's hills in your area, you can get up the hills with light pedaling or no pedaling and go at a, a decent speed. If you're a heavier rider, it will help you maintain the higher speeds. It will, um, again, get you up hills. Um, 750 seems to be good for if you're doing maybe the fat tire bike that weighs considerably more, you're doing hills, you're a bigger rider. So 750 is at the extreme. We find most people 500 is plenty. But again, if you're falling into under your use or weight limits of things, you may experiment with some of the 750s to see if you need that extra power. So main thing for the power is again, back to where are you gonna ride it and how fast do you wanna go? You know, all the considerations of of you and your bike and do you need the power to, to do what you want the intended use of the bike. Another thing to consider is the weight of the bike. Um, as far as riding it, because you have the electric, it, a lot of people are, well, it's not that critical because, you know, I've got the motor to help me. So, and that is true. I, in test riding bikes and in riding e-bikes, you know, the, the overall weight to me isn't when I'm out pedal, even when I turn the electric off and pedal it, not, especially on flat ground, not too critical. It, the bike's ride still pretty nice. Um, where it comes into play though is moving the bike around, putting it on a rack to, um, to carry it on maybe the back of your car or vehicle. Do you need to load it in the back of a truck at home? Even if it's not up a flight of stairs, maybe it's two or three steps you gotta get up. It's, are you gonna work on it yourself? Changing a flat tire. You know, how are you strong enough to physically lift this bike up? 
it, it can be an issue. Um, again, and just the overall, it's not for the ride quality, it's for the being able to move it around, load it on a bike rack, um, get it up the stairs if, if need be. Some people live in apartments and they have to take it upstairs with them. Lighter is going to be better. Um, other people, they're not going to transport it. They're just going to wheel it right into their garage or the backyard. Probably won't be an issue. Um, but definitely consider it. You know, do you need to lift this in any way? Are you going to need to work on it yourself? It, you know, all of the reason, reasons for the weight will be not in the riding, but will be in the management of it when you're not riding it. You know, getting it up and down. So definitely consider weight for transportation of the bike, where you're gonna store it, do you need to pick it up? So definitely weight can be a consideration. Next on my list is throttle versus no throttle. So there's different kinds of throttles depending on the bike you buy. And then there are some bikes that have no throttle. Let's start with the no throttle. That tends to be on the mid drive systems. You will find most mid drives, but not all, but most mid drives are pedal assist only. Um, no, no way to throttle the bike in any way. Um, again, you'll find that on the more performance bikes. They're not interested in having a throttle. They're interested in just having some assistance. Um, I know Bosch, which is one of the big makers of most of the mid drives, they do offer a throttle on some models. Most of, a lot of the bike shop brands tend to shy away from a throttle, but you, I think you'll start seeing more of it. So there are bikes without throttle, definite uses for it. Again, you need to decide whether it's an advantage or that you don't need it type of thing. Then when it comes to throttle, there's also different styles of throttle. This particular model is a thumb style throttle. There are also, I think here in my store, everything is thumb at the moment, but they also have more of a twist throttle. Usually they'll have one that's just a quarter of the grip and you twist it like on a motorcycle, some of them will be the full grip and it's a full throttle. Um, I tend to prefer the thumb, other people like the twist. So the advantage of a throttle is, is on the ride for whatever reason you don't want to pedal, let's say your knee starts hurting, you're just tired, you just don't want to pedal and you need to get home, there you go. Got an accelerator, just like on your car. You push that thing and off you go. Um, that seems to be, for most people, the advantage is for whatever reason, pick it, whether it's health issues, whether they're just tired, maybe they just don't want to pedal. They're just buzzing around the neighborhood having fun. You know, they're riding it like a scooter. But for whatever reason, the throttle can be enjoyable or a useful tool if you're tired or not feeling well or something hurts and it hurts to pedal, having that option, that doesn't mean you have to use it. All the bikes with, almost all bikes with throttle also have pedal assist, or you can just ride it as a regular bike, but definitely a useful tool. Um, there are instances, certain maybe a city, a bike trail, a park that says you can't have a throttle. There's different classes of e-bikes certain look for if that's the case I would look for a brand that the throttle is easily removed from this manufacturer you can unplug the wire and undo a little screw and remove it so let's say you go to a campground or a state park and they say no throttles a couple little tools and now you comply with their regulations there so if you do have a throttle that Another added feature, look for ways to remove it so that if somewhere you're going requires that the bike have no throttle. So you've been looking at a bunch of e-bikes and we're going through this list. The next thing I'd like to talk about are different options for them. Um, so we've talked about the different, you know, sizing and different things. So some of the options on a bike could be fat tire. It could be that it's a folding bike. It could be that it's, you know, designed as a commuter bike, as a recreation bike. It could be that it's more like a scooter type of a thing. 
So those options, again, depending on your use, some have multiple options. Some of them are folding in fat tire. Um, look at those options, especially, so for options versus accessories. Accessories, things that you can easily bolt on or that maybe come with it, such as racks, but options are gonna be more part of the bike. You know, is it folding, isn't it? You can't make a normal sized tire bike into a fat tire bike once you've already made the purchase. They're not, that is not available to you. Um, does it have built-in lights versus not built-in lights? Again, lights can be an accessory. It could be an option that comes on the bike. Um, size of batteries can be an option. I know some manufacturers will let you choose what, what size of battery comes. So think of your battery like a gas tank. It, you can have longer distances. Another option, like I just, on these two bikes we pointed out, they have suspension forks. Um, can be added to a bike like behind this here. This bike does not have a suspension fork. Could be added, but at considerable cost. So do you, do you need that suspension? Are the roads really bumpy? You know, will that make it more comfortable? Um, there's also, on the more performance end, there's rear suspension. So you would have a mountain bike. Do you, on a mountain bike, do you just need front suspension or will rear suspension help in your riding? So again, most of those options you gotta look at and based on your use are things that aren't easily switched out on a bike. Just as a comparison, it's real easy to switch out a seat. It's not easy to switch out your frame. <laughs> so look, <clears throat> look at the options again, depending on your use. Is that option a benefit? Is it not a benefit? Is it worth paying extra for? Because, especially because to add it later would be a considerable expense and not so much of an expense at the time of purchase. So definitely consider all the options. Another thing to consider when buying an e-bike will be the accessories. Tons of accessories. So, some of the ones that already come on this. So, here's a bike with, I would say, virtually no accessories on it. Other than maybe the adjustable stem, this can be an accessory. If your bike has a standard fixed stem, this stem is adjustable. But you'll notice not much else on the bike. So move one model over, now suddenly you have fenders and a rear rack as that can be considered accessories. So they come on this bike. I can easily put a rack and fenders on this bike. Um, there's front racks, there's baskets, um, then there's lighting systems that can be accessories. Again, on this bike, it comes with a headlight, but most bikes don't necessarily have it. I actually prefer headlights, headlight and taillight as an accessory rather than hardwired into the bike. Again, that's just my preference. Um, saddles as an accessory. You know, from the factory, you don't get to choose the saddle, but one or two bolts, saddles come off. There's big, wide, cushy cruiser seats. There's little narrow performance seats. I don't shy away from a particular bike just because of saddle. Easily, easily switched out. Um, thing to consider, again, on, on choosing a bike and accessories, you start running out of room on a lot of the handlebars. I found a lot of the e-bikes, because of between the handlebar assembly, the, all the cables that are in front of here, a lot of baskets don't easily fit. Um, depending on where the control panel or dashboard is mounted here, again, a lot of baskets wanna clamp around the handlebars, not much room here. So consider your accessories, Will you know, you might, order a basket online and you get it and you figure out, oh, it doesn't fit. You've got to know the diameter of your handlebar, is there clearance? Good example, if your bike has a front suspension fork, a lot of baskets have struts that go down that need to mount on the front wheel. You can't use that because that inhibits the fork from moving up and down. You need a basket that only clamps around the stem and handlebars, not down to the front wheel. 
that's probably been our biggest thing on accessories is will it fit? Um, a lot of, let's use rear rocks as an example. In their description, they will say universal fit. My fun to that is, yeah, universally fits nothing. Um, they usually have to be adapted in some way. If you're pretty handy at, you know, bending or moving or figuring out the wide range of hardware that comes with it, no big deal, you make it fit, it is universal. Um, other people, you know, the, usually the directions aren't very clear and they're like, they've purchased even from us a rear rack, take it home, and they come back, it doesn't fit. They bring the bike in, we can make it fit again. It's, so on, on a lot of these accessories, it, you know, pay attention to where it's gonna mount on your bike. Is it compatible with the bike you've purchased? Um, does the manufacturer offer the accessories? Sometimes that helps. You buy a rack direct from the manufacturer of your bike, it's more than likely gonna bolt right up. You buy, you know, like this front rack is made with the, and already has holes in the frame, screws right on, very simple installation. If you bought something similar to this from another manufacturer and these tabs aren't in the same spot or they're made to mount to the front, doesn't work so well. So a lot of times look to the original manufacturer. A lot of my customers are looking at cell phone holders. That's a big accessory. Again, look at where it's gonna mount on the handlebar. Um, is there room? Here, there's a lot of extra room. Others, not so much room on the handlebar or it's curved. Um, here's a good example. We have some trouble because of it, this, this amount of distance here, but it goes from wide to thin, it's curved. A lot of times, you know, now the cell phone, instead of mounting perfect, it's off to the side. So again, consider all of those things on your accessories. Will it fit? You know, is it compatible with my bike? Again, huge range of accessories, but we all hate to make that purchase and then find out it doesn't fit our bike. So definitely look at all the accessories, but consider, is it the right accessory for my bike? Other accessories to consider that don't bolt to the bike would be things that, one, that would bolt to you. <laughs> um, helmets. Um, use them, don't use them, personal choice, highly recommended. You're more than likely going to go a lot faster than you would on a traditional bike. And really, speed's not the issue. It, at some point, you're going to fall down. and. The, the new helmets these days are very light, very comfortable, adjustable. Um, talk to a doctor or nurse, they're gonna tell you it's gonna save your life. So again, different styles, different types. My comment to customers on helmets is, you wanna like the way it fits and you wanna like the way it looks. Just like clothing, if one of those don't fall into play, you're not gonna use it. So definitely try them on. There are tons of different features and things, but the important thing is try it on, make sure it fits. Most of them highly adjustable. They've, they've come up with some great sizing features now to make them fit really well. Some, some of the helmets now are specific for e-bikes, a little higher crash ratings, something definitely to look into, especially if you're somebody wanting to go a little faster, maybe you're riding a lot in traffic you might want even a little more protection than just the traditional bike helmet. But highly recommended that you consider a helmet. Another thing is maybe, depending on where you're gonna park the bike or where you're going, you want that bike to be there when you get back, you wanna lock it. There's chain locks, there's U-locks, cable locks. I'm not gonna go into the pros and cons of the different locks but it only takes a minute for somebody to steal your bike if it's not locked up. Um, it's, it's heartbreaking when you walk out of 7-Eleven or the Starbucks or wherever you just, I was just gone for a minute and the bike is gone. And so even minimal locking up will keep that, that person that's just a, you know, they see the bike there, they weren't intending on stealing a bike, but they're like, hey, and they jump on it and go. It, they, can, they can get it in a minute. But with some kind of lock on there, at least you're gonna slow them down. If you're locking it somewhere where it's higher crime or maybe you know, you're, 
it's outside the RV and you're asleep inside the RV, God, you know, you've got a couple of nice e-bikes there, you wanna use maybe some heavier duty protection so that when you wake up in the morning, they're still there. So definitely considering your purchase. Um, purchase a, a lock that fits the needs of where you're gonna lock in for how long. Something to consider, I don't know if, you know, we don't talk about it much in the shop, but people have brought it up, would be where are you gonna store your bike? You know, can you hang it from hooks? Um, leave it outside, garage, shed, carrying it up the stairs into your apartment. That huge consideration on, on maybe on which style of bike you get, you know. Storage is important. These are mechanical devices that, you know, don't do so well if you leave them out in the weather. Uh, security, you want to make sure they're protected so that they don't get stolen. So whether it's your garage, a shed, or in the house, if it's outside, you have some kind of cover, maybe under the patio. Um, the, we the weather is hard on bicycles, whether electric or not. So definitely consider, you know, how much room do you have to store the bike? Is, is it easily gotten in and out of? Um, do you need to, you know, back to the weight thing, if the bike's heavy and you need to store it on some kind of storage hooks or something to get it off the floor, could be a consideration. Um, some of the bikes with hydraulic brakes, you can't, you don't want to store them upside down because it, it will get air in the, the brake lines. Um, again, look at that, you know, is, is this bike too big to fit where you need it to go versus something else? You know, do you need a smaller bike because you only have so much room to put it? Um, if you're storing it in a shed, there's probably no electrical outlet in there. Is the battery easily removed? So you can leave the bike in the shed, take the battery in the house and charge it in the house. Things, those kind of things for storage is like, okay, is there an electrical outlet? Is, is the bike gonna be protected from the weather? Will it get damaged in any way, such as flipping it upside down? So consider storage when you're buying a bike too. It may be the difference between one model over another because of where you need to store. So uh, what I consider very important, I've been a bike mechanic since I was 15 years old. I've been working on bikes my whole life. These e new e-bikes, a lot of them you're buying direct from the manufacturer. They tell you what a great warranty they have. And, Everything's wonderful, till it's not. And even the brands I sell, whether it's regular bicycles or e-bikes, things can go wrong. It's a mechanical device. I don't know a single person that hasn't had something go wrong with their car over the years. You know, and you pay tens and tens of thousands of dollars for your car. They don't run perfect forever. An e-bike won't run perfect forever either. Um, you may be really, if you're really mechanically inclined like myself, might not be an issue. You buy some tools, you, you get the stuff, you watch some YouTube videos, and no big deal. For most of us though, like even myself, there's things I don't repair myself. Um, I've, I've talked to different people and they've been into different bike shops. There are bike shops. So you will want to look at this in your area and maybe even if you're not considering buying an e-bike from them, what are their service policies? So you get a flat tire on the back of your e-bike and it's a hub drive motor and you're like, I don't wanna mess with that. And you wheel it down to your local bike shop and they say, we don't work on any e-bikes. And you say, but it's just a flat tire and they turn you away because it's an e-bike. Other shops will maybe, do, you know, you might ask, maybe they'll fix flat tires, they'll fix the bike part of it a chain, a, a brake adjustment, but diagnosing an electrical problem, maybe you're, hey, the e-bike's just not working, it won't turn on, or it's running a lot slower than it did. If they don't sell that brand, they may say, we won't do that part of it. So shop your area for bike shops before you even start looking at the e-bikes and find out, is there service in the area? And how, how much service? I mean, even our shop, as much as I'd like to work on every single brand, I can't. There's parts availability, um, technical assistance from some manufacturers is non-existent. 
They have nobody on site to help me diagnose what's wrong with theirs. Um, it, it might be a proprietary part and I can't get the part. I've now spent an hour trying to fix your bike to find out the manufacturer has no parts, has anything. I can't bill you for that hour, the bike's not fixed. So that's kind of one of the reasons why the shop might have that policy. You might, why are you turning my business away? Well, sometimes it, there are reasons why, and unfortunately, the e-bike industry, there's not a lot of standards or regulations, and you know you might be forced to deal direct with them and that's okay. Hey, there's plenty of online um, e-bikes. There's plenty of e-bikes that have great customer service, have available parts, and your local shop still won't deal with it. I, but you need to find that out because somewhere down the line, you're probably gonna need some help with that e-bike and, and definitely look into that. How are the reviews of customer service on, on the brand you're considering, whatever brand that is? Um, Take some of that with a grain of salt because there's always going to be unhappy customers. But overall, you know, do they have a range of replacement parts so a year down the road, you know, when something wears out, can you get it? Um, a lot of these bikes are disc brakes. You know, what brand of disc brake is it? Are those pads available? Um, even one of the brands I carry, one of their models, as of right now, I can only get the brake pads from them. That scares me. I, I would much rather be able to have multiple places to buy a part from. Um, other of, of their models, I can get brake pads just about anywhere. So, and brake pads wear out. It's a normal part of riding the bike. So definitely service is gonna be a huge thing over the next couple of years. Especially if you get this e-bike and you ride it a lot, things wear out. Even if it's not a warranty issue, it's just a matter of getting brake pads, getting a chain, um, you know, whatever part on it that you need that it's not warranty, it's just, you used it up. So definitely do a little bit of research on, on service. Maybe you're, here would be an example, you're RVing and you're out somewhere, you know, you're 2,000 miles from home, you're near a big city and something happens to your e-bike and you're trying to find a shop that will work on it, and four shops later, not a single one will work on it. Now you're down. Um, I'm hoping that over the next few years that won't be an issue, that most bike shops will you know, get more and more adept at, at working on, on e-bikes and the different models, and we will have access more and more to parts availability and be able to, to service just about any e-bike. But as of right now, it can be a huge problem. So definitely look in your area for a, a, a shop that will service the bike that you're looking to purchase.